should see how messy my room is from here forward that you can't see. <laughs> yeah, I know everything about having a swamp of a room. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, w w when I clean my room, it's a rare occasion that happens every few months, and I feel very proud of myself. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Radio Maria US and on YouTube on Queen of Peace Media, and I have a very special guest. Why are we holding our phones to our ears? Because there have been so many technological problems, and those in the know know that that's an extremely good sign. So as the blood rushes out of our hands as we hold our cell phones, I'd like to introduce to you Father Daniel Maria. He is a new priest, a wonderful priest, a man in love with Our Lady who has great stories and facts to tell about a very controversial pilgrimage site called Medjahuchi. No, I'm kidding. I say that because nobody <laughs> can pronounce it. <laughs> Medjugorje in the former Yugoslavia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. I myself have been there five times. I've read up on it. I've written three books that contain stories regarding it. I would like to, I'm very excited to say that Father Daniel Maria has completed a book that will be published about his conversion story involving Medjugorje and another book on Medjugorje that I'll let him tell you about. Thank you for coming on the show. Christine, it's a pleasure to be on the show with you. As you know, I've been a fan of your work for years. And, you know, there was a time when I heard somebody say, he met you in middle Georgia. We realized, no, it's, it's Medjugorje. It's Medjugorje. <laughs> middle Georgia. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, yes, no one can pronounce it. And um, I think the locals can, and that's about it. But why... Why, in a nutshell, I know there's so much to say on this show, because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how unfortunate all the rumors and uh, non-facts are regarding Medjugorje that keep getting recycled in the Catholic media. And, you know, if they were true, uh, no one should believe in the authenticity of Medjugorje. If all of the rumors and the facts purported facts, which aren't facts at all, were true, I can totally understand why people would find it abhorrent. They find it the biggest hoax and something that's evil and going to consume and devour souls. And why is it that Father Daniel Marie and I ha do not believe that? Why is it that the church is moving in a strong direction of of authenticity as well and why do people not believe that the church has said such more positive things about Medjugorje than ever and we'll explore the criticisms and we'll also explore the wonderful things in our lives and the lives of people we know that have happened because of Medjugorje and would you start with a prayer please for us absolutely my pleasure in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Eternal Father, we ask for your blessings upon this show. We ask that you just release your Holy Spirit and sanctify our words, that we speak supernatural truth, that we bring the beauty of Our Lady's message to every viewer, that we will be able to truly witness, Lord, to how you have moved in our lives and the truth and the reality of Our Lady's presence. Mother Mary, entrust this program to you. We thank you for the gift of your spiritual motherhoods. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners, Jesus. now and at the hour of our death. Our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So would you first tell me why you fell in love with Medjugorje? What is, what is your personal reason? Yeah, well, f for me, I was a student in college at DePaul University in Chicago. And 
I wasn't a devout person. I was somebody who came from a Catholic family, um, Polish Catholic, grew up culturally Catholic. However, I didn't have a strong faith. I didn't know whether the Eucharist is real. I didn't know whether Jesus is actually God. I didn't have a strong faith in Our Lady. And then one day, my mother gave me a book. Um, it was called Medjugorje of the Message. She actually read the Polish version, and she recommended that I buy an English one because um, I speak Polish, but I don't read um, the language. But it was a book, Medjugorje, The Message by Wayne Weibel. And for anyone who knows anything about that book, that's a book that changes lives. That's a book that transforms people. I mean, it's remarkable. You go on the Amazon page and almost every review starts with a sentence that says something like, this book changed my life. Or this, reading this book was a turning point. And for me, that was the experience. I read about the apparitions in Medjugorje. I was so moved by Our Lady's message, the message of prayer and fasting and coming back to God. And I was just so amazed that things like this can happen in the 20th and 21st centuries. You know, because my doubt when I was uh, a skeptical student was, is the supernatural real? You know, can the supernatural happen? I remember sitting in a New Testament class and we were reading about the miracles of Jesus. And I realized if the miracles aren't real, if he was just an ethical teacher, then he is no different than a Socrates or a Buddha, you know, just another wisdom figure. So I need the miracles to be real. I need the resurrection to be real in order to believe that he is God. And I love the words of Pope John Paul II. He once said, today's world has lost its sense of the supernatural, but many are searching for it, and they find it in Medjugorje mm -hmm. through prayer, penance, and fasting. And those words just pierced my heart because those words defined my conversion. Mm -hmm. When I started reading that book, I felt the supernatural presence of God. Mm -hmm. I felt the love of God and the beauty of God and the beauty of Our Lady's message. And I just fell in love with her. And I wanted to give my life to her. And, you know, being a person who lives in the West, there is a skeptical influence that still remains. You know, my heart was deeply moved. My soul was moved. I felt like I want to give myself to this truth, but my mind was still skeptical. My mind was still asking, can this be real in the 20th century or 21st century? Marian apparitions? And then what fascinated, fascinated me is I started looking up uh, secular books by secular journalists who have investigated Medjugorje. Mm. And it, I was absolutely interested in discovering that Medjug the Medjugorje apparitions have been subjected to such extensive scientific examination, medical scientific studies, and, you know, knowing that the visionaries actually were tested by EEGs, which measured their brain waves, showing what's happening inside their brain as they have their apparition, as they enter ecstasy. There were lie detector tests, there were clinical psychological studies. And it fascinated, fascinated me how all this neuroscience and science was able to disprove a number of alternative explanations. You know, it showed that there's no hallucination, there's no epilepsy, there's no neurosis but they do enter a profound altered state of consciousness during the apparition that scientists cannot explain. So something very powerful is happening to them. And I was also moved by stories of doctors and skeptics who've, um, who had powerful experiences. I love sharing the story of Dr. Marco Marginelli. He was a fervent atheist who heard about Medjugorje and he traveled there in 1988 hoping to expose it as a fraud. And then he, uh, he tested the ecstasies of the visionaries with the EEG. He came to the conclusion that they enter a genuine ecstasy. There's nothing pathological. And he admitted that he was very disturbed by things that he saw. It really challenged his atheism. There was a woman in the pilgrimage group who had leukemia and she was miraculously healed on that pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. 
And what, what really touched him and uh, really scared him because it challenged a lot for him was uh, the behavior of the birds. He was saying that before the apparitions began, there were hundreds of birds outside just chirping and cooing and being incredibly loud. And he noticed the very second that the visionaries fell to their knees, went into ecstasy, had their apparition of Our Lady, every bird outside would go completely silent. And then he said, he admitted later in an interview, that that absolute silence of the birds, it haunted him. Mm. He could not get it out of his mind. Mm. And, then a few, and then a few months after returning to Italy, he actually became a practicing Catholic. Mm. So what a grace, what power. You know, somebody, somebody asked me, why do you think the birds go silent during the apparitions? Because uh, numerous pilgrims have noticed this, that the birds may be loud, and then the second that the apparition begins, they go silent. And my interpretation is that silence is, a, is an attitude that we associate with reverence, mm. reverence for the sacred. Mm. For example, during a priestly ordination, of course, you have the liturgy of the word, you have preaching, you have music. But that very moment when the bishop lays his hands on a man's head to ordain him a priest, the whole assembly goes silent. It's just such a profound reverence for us, for what is happening in that sacred supernatural moment in terms of heaven meeting earth with that indelible mark of Jesus Christ. So, of course, it would make sense for even the birds, even nature, mm -hmm. to in some perhaps spiritual sense feel mm -hmm. the presence of the sacred mm -hmm. during an apparition and, uh, and have that attitude of silence. It's really a profound reality. So... A lot of things that have really led me uh, to Medjugorje and have completely opened me to a mystical, supernatural faith that believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the apparitions of Our Lady. Because if Our Lady can appear in the 21st century, the mother of Jesus Christ, then it shows us that the miracles of Jesus, they're not some construction of first century Palestine, mm -hmm. but a living reality, a living reality mm -hmm. that continues to the present moment. So praise God. Praise God. Yes, and how many times have you traveled there? I've been there twice. Okay, so I win. No. <laughs> <laughs> You've probably been there at least uh, 27 times, Christine. Some people have, which is probably a problem, but <laughs> no, I mean, I there's so many stories to tell, and um, I'd rather interview you, but just some are flitting through my mind. Um flitting through my mind as we speak. And one is the salvation of my marriage, and that's hard to forget. Mm. Uh, I was called to go to Medjugorje. Jesus said, bring your husband. I don't have his heart. And I said, what are you mm. talking about? He works with the homeless. He goes to Mass on Sundays. And um, that whole story that I won't get into is in my first book. I think, did you review this one? Full of Grace, Miraculous Stories of Healing and Conversion Through Mary's Intercession. Was that? I, did, I didn't officially review it, but I read it and I was very impressed with it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that counts. Um, and so in, in the book Full of Grace, my husband's story and my story is in there. And mm -hmm. he had the sin of people pleasing. So in his job and in his activities, he wasn't seeking to please God, but to please others. And so it was a trap. And, and one that you wouldn't notice on the outside, right? But God could see it on the inside. So several miracles in Medjugorje on the top of Cross Mountain. Lightning struck when there was no rain, no clouds. A vertical line that split the sky made him cry. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. he heard Our Lady's voice during one of the apparitions. He was clinging wow. to a rock um, because he was scared of Mary. Because she, uh, she was in the way for his touchdown to Jesus. He was a linebacker that she needed to get out of the way. He thought that she was going to mess up his relationship with Jesus. He had some Protestant formation and she was just scary. Mm -hmm. And so he was clinging to Jesus because in the apparition, Lord knows what she might do. And uh, and he was clinging to the his leg like this as though his leg was Jesus. And he put his hand down when the apparition began to steady himself. 
and he heard the words, don't let go. Mm. And then so he began to bring his arms back to cling to Jesus, but he felt like his arms were being shaped into a cradle like he was holding a child, a baby. And she said, no, this is how you hold my son, not in fear, but in gentleness Mm. and tenderness. So he was Mm. having all these communications with Our Lady, didn't want to pray the rosary, when at night before we left for Medjugorje, he'd want to drink a beer and watch sports, you know, and didn't want anything to do with those beads and went straight to Jesus, straight to Jesus, which I understand, but our, he didn't understand that Our Lady goes straight to Jesus with our concerns. And so uh, he's uh, made the family pray the rosary every night ever since for over a decade. So I always tell people, uh, if you want to change your man, give him to another woman. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. And what better woman than Our Lady, huh? Amen. And, you know, things like, funny things, like my friend, she was near a puppy when Mariana, one of the visionaries, was speaking, and he pooped, and she began to smell roses. <laughs> so if you don't, if you don't know, um, you often smell roses in Medjugorje where there are no roses and no rose perfume. Uh, my friend's back pain, the minute she landed in Medjugorje, debilitating back pain where she couldn't lie down for months. She had to sleep sitting up, was just gone, and it's never come back. Mm. Um, so That's many gone. stories. I mean, the is this the one that you endorsed the, of Men and Mary? How six men won the greatest yes, battle of their lives? Okay, my apologies. <laughs> yes. So, yes, so that has stories of men involving Medjugorje that will knock your socks off. So... You know, I've, I've heard an argument, Father, that uh, with all these conversions and like Father Don Calloway, he became, a, he, he became a Catholic and then a priest simply by reading a book on Medjugorje as well. But people say in, to deny Medjugorje that you can't look at the fruits. You can't look at the fruits. It's clearly that doesn't matter that there's something diabolical going on there and it's a phony. How would you respond to that and maybe some other criticisms that you've heard? Sure, sure. Great question, Christine. Um, The truth is we need to abide by what the church says. And currently the church has a very positive uh, perception of Medjugorje. It's actually a long history, so I could get into it a bit just to emphasize where did the controversy come from? Why did Medjugorje become such a you know, provocative subject? Um, basically, it begins with the local bishop of Mostar um, during the apparitions, whose name was uh, Bishop Pavel Zanich. And the bishop was a supporter of Medjugorje at the beginning. You know, most people don't know that he was a very supportive of the apparitions and the visionaries. And then the communist officials arrested Father Yozo Zovko, who was the parish priest at Medjugorje at St. James. And he went into the underground communist uh, prison system. He was tortured. Um, they, they actually made deals. They said or try to make deals. You know, if you disavow the apparitions, this can end. I believe he spent about 18 months in prison. He came out deaf in one ear because of the abuse, and he never disavowed Our Lady's apparitions. You know, he was true to the to the uh, last moments. But and isn't there a movie about that called Gospa? I believe. Yeah, yeah. I I know Martin Sheen definitely stars in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Martin Sheen plays Father Yozo, and it is a depiction of that struggle when Father Yozo went to prison and went through that horrible ordeal. And what's interesting is that after that happened, or as it was happening, the communists threatened the local bishop. Mm -hmm. And they said to him, if you do not disavow the apparitions, what happened to Father Yozo, it's going to happen to you too. Mm. Shortly after that, the bishop went silent on the apparitions, mm. despite the fact that he was a vocal supporter. And eventually he became a vocal critic of the apparitions. Now, there's a couple of theories as to why he became a critic. One theory given by the bishop himself. So the two theories. Uh, one theory is 
that the bishop succumbed to communist pressure because of what happened to Father Yozo. Actually, years later, after the bishop passed away, uh, Croatian and Italian journalists act actually found uh, documentation that showed that the bishop corroborated with the communists in trying to undermine the apparitions and the devotions there. Mm. The communists started seeing so many people gathering around the visionaries for an apparition as a potentially revolutionary act against the state. So there was a lot of political persecution. But the other theory as to why the bishop changed his mind, uh, a theory given by the bishop himself, is that there was uh, disobedience. Disobedience from the visionaries, disobedience from the Franciscans as well uh, from the parish there. And what it's connected to is there were two young Franciscan friars who were ordained priests, recently ordained priests. And these guys allegedly you know, were on fire, had a strong faith. And there's a, a long history in that region of a rivalry between the Franciscan clergy and the secular clergy, unfortunately. And these Franciscans were a celebrating mass in a church where the bishop believed they didn't have the rights, uh, that it didn't belong to them. And it, it led to a process where he actually took away their faculties and uh, wanted to laicize them. Uh, many people were upset uh, because they were two young priests who had a lot of faith, uh, very passionate. So they asked uh, the visionaries, can you ask Our Lady about it? Did the bishop make the right decision? And one of the visionaries, Vitska, she um, she asked during an apparition whether the bishop made the right decision. Um, Our Lady apparently said, quote, the bishop acted prematurely and he should reconsider. Both men are innocent. According to Bishop Zanich, that was it. Uh, he claimed that Our Lady would never contradict the bishop. These cannot be real apparitions. And he, he called this disobedience. He became a vocal critic. But what isn't often reported is that the case of these two Franciscans, it actually came to the Vatican, to a Vatican tribunal. And the Vatican tribunal ruled that the bishop acted, quote, wrongly and illegally. Wow. And it, they actually, yeah, they actually reinstated one of the friars, you know, his faculties. Uh, the other friar, unfortunately, uh, didn't want to wait that long. It took many years, this oh. process, this legal process. Wow. So he left the priesthoods. But, mm. uh, but notice that in that case, you know, the message of Our Lady was, if any, anything, mild and accurate compared to what the Vatican eventually ruled. Huh. And that was never reported? I, I just find it amazing how these other half the other half of the story regarding Medjugorje is ignored by the American Catholic press I, I honestly don't understand it no wonder people are confused yeah it's absolutely remarkable and remarkably the story continues so what also happened was as the bishop was becoming a vocal critic, he released a document in October of 1984 to all the Episcopal conferences across the world, so all the bishop conferences, uh -huh. that claimed that the apparitions in Medjugorje, he has come to the conclusion, are a case of collective hallucination. Huh. But what, what was striking, and many church leaders noted this, was that that statement contradicted what the science actually showed. Mm -hmm. So one of the people who was just startled by this proclamation was the great French Mariologist, Father René Lorenzen, mm -hmm. who brought a French team of doctors and physicians to study the visionaries. And he addressed Bishop Zanich and he said, what are you doing? I mean, the science has showed that they are not hallucinating, that it's not any form of pathology. Why are you spreading this? And actually another uh, church leader, Archbishop uh, Franz Franick, who was um, Archbishop of Split, actually got in touch with Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, who was head of the CDF, and he asked him to intervene because this isn't fair what is happening. The, the bishop here is slandering innocent people, mm -hmm. um, and he's promulgating falsehoods about them. And what's interesting is, you know, the bishop, 
he he came to Rome in 1986. He wanted to submit a negative ruling on Medjugorje. Cardinal Ratzinger met with him, and Cardinal Ratzinger actually chastised the bishop. He said he disapproved of his methods of investigation. He ordered him to be silent on Medjugorje, and he took away jurisdiction um, of Medjugorje, of the apparitions uh, from the bishop, and gave it to a higher ecclesial body, the uh, Yugoslav Conference of Bishops. And so often when this case is reported to the media, what's, especially the mainstream Catholic media, what we hear is that the local bishop opposed the apparitions, claimed disobedience, therefore something was wrong, there's something wrong with the apparitions, but we never get the full story. The full story that the bishop was actually disciplined by his superiors in Rome. He was he was ordered to keep silence, and he actually kept speaking out against Medjugorje. So he's the disobedient one in all this. How ironic. Ironically. Yes, thanks. <laughs> right. Interesting. So we're going to take a break. This is Find Your Way Home with Christine Watkins, and I have with me Father Daniel Maria. And we'll be right back. Or we'll stay. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> or we'll stay. That's funny. Okay. Welcome back. And I have here with me Father Daniel Maria. And he has been sharing with us the history of the church and Medjugorje. And let's pick up where we left off. Sure. So we mentioned how in 1986, Cardinal Ratzinger took the authority of Medjugorje away from the local bishop, and he gave it to the Yugoslav Conference of Bishops. Um, the conference never finished their work because of the outbreak of the wars in the former Yugoslavia in the early 90s. They did release a statement in 1994 known as the Zadar Declaration. In that statement, in the first sentence, they said that it cannot be determined yet whether one is dealing with supernatural revelations. And interestingly, that statement was so strongly debated. Uh, critics of Medjugorje said that statement proves that it's not supernatural. Uh, supporters of Medjugorje, on the other hand, said that statement says that nothing has been established yet as supernatural, but it's still open to the possibility. Because when the church investigates a phenomena, a Marian apparition, there's three possible conclusions one can reach, either supernatural, or not supernatural, or it hasn't been established yet that it is supernatural. The first conclusion, obviously positive. Second conclusion, obviously negative. Third conclusion, actually neutral, um, establishing that further investigations are necessary. And eventually the Vatican cl uh, clarified it because um, Bishop Zanich's successor, uh, Bishop Rodko Perich, uh, continued the negative position of, uh, of his uh, predecessor. He was very anti medjugorje and he explains in his opinion that the Yugoslav bishops reached a conclusion of not supernatural. But then the CDF clarified in a letter, and in the letter they clarified that what Bishop Perich says is his personal opinion. Um, and it's not, it doesn't reflect the opinion of the church on Medjugorje, and that letter said that private pilgrimages are allowed to Medjugorje. And eventually we realized that, it, in fact, it wasn't a ruling that said not supernatural. Because in March of 2010, Pope Benedict XVI formed a new commission, a higher commission, uh, International Vatican Commission, to further investigate Medjugorje. Because the church has a document, a CDF document, and, and CDF is 19... Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in the Vatican. So that's where that those three letters come from. That's right. Yeah. 
That's right. That's right. Yeah, the uh, the office within the Roman Curia that deals with um, uh, theological issues and even uh, such sensitive subjects like um, like Marian apparitions at times. And that document, which came out in 1978, norms on evaluating apparitions, explains that an apparition is first judged by the local bishop. However, it can be taken away from the authority of the bishop and given to a higher conference of bishops. And there's also the possibility of being given to an even higher authority, which would be an international Vatican commission. And so in that sense, the local bishop um, for a long time now hasn't had uh, the the word on Medjugorje hasn't been this, uh, the official authority in terms of ruling on Medjugorje, which also has been a, a media distortion. Uh, even very recent publications, you know, point to the local bishop's oppos uh, opposition to Medjugorje as if uh, pointing to the official authority of the church who opposes it when actually authority was taken away from him a long time ago and he was asked to remain silent on the topic. Uh, the International Vatican Commission eventually came to the conclusion um, after seven years they released the findings that they acknowledge the supernatural character of the first seven apparitions and also they recommend it that Pope Francis lift the ban on public pilgrimages and allow public pilgrimages. So a diocese can officially sponsor a pilgrimage to Medjugorje. And that's what happened. Actually, it was, uh, I believe it was May 12, 2019, which was Mother's Day, where Pope Francis mm -hmm. officially announced that uh, public pilgrimages to Medjugorje are allowed. And, you know, talk about a gift for our spiritual mother mm. on Mother's Day. Mm. And if, and that year, during the Medjugorje Youth Festival, many bishops and cardinals attended, um, including from the Vatican. So in recent years, it has been uh, moving towards a much more positive decision. And, you know, you can't ignore the fruits. Because in that 1978 document on how the church evaluates revelation, pub, uh, private revelations, there's three main criteria. One is the theological message of the uh, revelation or the apparition. You know, is the message orthodox? Another criteria is the visionaries. Are the visionaries experiencing conversion, spiritual fruits? Are they psychologically healthy? Uh, evaluating the visionaries. And the third aspect is just the devotion at the site, is it encouraging spiritual fruits? Are people converting? I, are they returning to the sacraments? And Pope John Paul II, he saw the fruits. Therefore, he called Medjugorje the spiritual heart of the world. He also called it the confessional of the world. He said, if I wasn't Pope, I would be in Medjugorje confessing. And there's been so many conversions, so many priestly vocations, so many vocations to the consecrated life, uh, including many uh, healings, physical healings. Um, so it's just been remarkable in terms of the spiritual fruits that have come from that sacred site. Absolutely. And I know a lot of people are also wary of these 10 Medjugorje secrets. And some people may have heard that one of the visionaries, Mariana, who for many years now has received an apparition of Our Lady on the second of each month. And just very recently, Our Lady told her that she would no longer be appearing in those monthly apparitions. Um, do you have any comment on what we know about the secrets and why you think Mary stopped appearing to her? Although she continues to appear to other visionaries and nothing has changed with them. Sure, sure. What a good question. Um, in terms of what we know about the secrets, we know that each visionary is to receive 10 secrets. We're actually not sure whether there are 10 individual secrets, uh, different for each visionary, or are they 10 of the same secrets, or is it perhaps a combination of some personal secrets for the visionaries and some public messages to the world. But the visionaries have said that the third secret, 
is something that Our Lady has um, allowed to be known, and that uh, the third secret says that there will be a supernatural, indestructible sign that will appear on Apparition Hill, the uh, site of the first apparitions. And it's a supernatural sign that will will be something that the world can see. It will be um, eternally present on the hill. You will not be able to destroy it. And it will show that this was a, an act of God. Uh, Miriana actually gave an interview where she said that when the first secrets begin, first couple secrets, there will be skeptics in the West who will say that this could have been uh, explained naturally. Maybe it was some type of natural phenomena. However, when the sign appears, the supernatural sign, no person in the world will be able to doubt that this was an act of God. Mm. You know, so there's a very uh, powerful statement there. Um, regarding Mariana's recent apparitions, you know, she used to receive apparitions, as you mentioned, Christine, on the second of the month to pray for unbelievers. And it was interesting, right? Because just a few months ago, they stopped. Uh, there was no real, really no uh, public explanation as to why they stopped. So that remains a mystery. It was very curious that the apparitions of Miriana stopped around the time that COVID was beginning and really uh, beginning to uh, emerge around the world. So perhaps a very ominous sign there. But in terms of a personal interpretation of why they stopped, you know, I'll honor the fact that it's a mystery since uh, Miriana has not provided any commentary regarding that. And regarding some of the other criticisms, uh, one of them I hear or read a lot is that Mary said in Medjugorje that all religions are the same. And I actually found the quote, and you said, uh, Father Daniel, that you also are aware of it. And this is what Mary actually said, which is different from that accusation. On October 1st, 1981, she was asked by one of the, the visionary children, are all religions the same? She says, members of all faiths are equal before God. God rules over each faith just like a sovereign over his kingdom. In the world, all religions are not the same. I just want you to hear that, people. She actually said the opposite of the accusation. All religions are not the same because all people have not complied with the commandments of God. They reject and disparage them. So that's one. Um, another strange accusation is that Mary was a handkerchief was bleeding and Mary dropped Jesus. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just think, sorry, it's just kind of a funny one. That's, that's just completely false. That's a rumor. Uh, another one is that these have been going on too long. I, I, I do want to mention how many years has it been? It's been since 1981. Um, so we have decades of messages and the main messages are pray, especially the rosary each day, pray from the heart, fast on bread and water on Wednesdays and Fridays, go to confession monthly, read your Bible, and receive the Eucharist as frequently as possible. And not a single message has been against the faith or against church teachings, not one. So it's interesting that people are just waiting for some other shoe to drop not looking at the decades of people praying, fasting, confessing, doing penance, and receiving God in the form of the host. And instead, there, there's this fear. We're just waiting for every single person to be completely deceived by Satan who's suddenly going to show up. So <laughs> that's a, that was a real mistake, I must say, if this is true on Satan's part, to get people to become priests, to become Catholic, to do all that prayer. I mean, I think he must be really upset that his plan is going in that direction for decades, I must say. But um, can you comment on that, and especially on the accusation that she's appeared too much, um, on what Pope Francis said, she's not a postman delivering all the time, and what, what Pope Francis actually said recently, and how, um, how that could be the Blessed Virgin Mary and how you believe it is her giving many messages all these years. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's so interesting. I mean, Christine, sometimes if you need good comedy, you just look at some of these criticisms from <laughs> Medjugorje critics. You know, I was giving a talk today to a few of our students, and the talk was on Our Lady's Joy. And I shared a story to begin the talk of a prominent Medjugorje critic who, who wrote in his book that in one apparition, um, the visionary said that Our Lady has a sense of humor and sometimes she teases them. And this uh, critic responded, that shows that this isn't the mother of God because she, Mary would never laugh. <laughs> 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 and, and I was thinking to myself, she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy. I mean, if she doesn't laugh, she's not just a stiff statue, you know, a mom who teases her kids. I could see that as such a sign of affection and love and, you know, make them feel so comfortable in her sacred presence. I mean, how beautiful that is to hear. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yes, yeah, so many of these um, accusations, uh, you know, most of them unfounded, uh, that the accusation that the apparitions have gone on too long. And this hasn't happened before with Lords or Fatima and so on. Well, what, what such critics um, ignore or perhaps or perhaps are ignorant of is that there is an approved apparition. Um, it happened in Laos, France between the years 1664 to 1718. So all those decades, Our Lady was appearing even longer than Medjugorje. So we do have precedence for long apparitions that does not disqualify an apparition for being inauthentic. And there's a reference to, to, to that uh, comment by Pope Francis. So it was um, the day after Pope Francis was leaving, um, he was leaving Fatima the day after he canonized Jacinta and Francisco. And he gave one of his famous plain interviews where he's answering questions of the cuff and apparently he was asked uh, about Medjugorje and allegedly he said something like um, Our Lady isn't a postmistress who appears every day. Um, and he said, you know, that's my personal opinion. Uh, so, so but then he says, however, people go there and they convert. And that's not a magic wand. That's a pastoral reality that happens. There's real fruits there. They encounter God there. And interestingly, um, recently there was um, actually, I, I believe it was a couple uh, years ago in 2017, there was an interview with Pope Francis where he commented about that plain interview. He was saying that's not what he intended to uh, communicate, that, you know, he's uh, this unbeliever and that he actually has a heart for Medjugorje mm. and that he has protected Medjugorje. He, he said that he is the one who made sure that there's a uh, papal envoy in Medjugorje, Ar Archbishop Henrik Heuser, uh, who's currently currently has an office in Medjugorje on behalf of the Vatican to watch over Medjugorje. And he's the one, obviously, who um, Pope Francis, who has allowed public pilgrimages. And so it looks like Medjugorje is on the verge of becoming a pontifical shrine. So in that sense, it, it looks very positive. Uh, the fact that the Pope is allowing public pilgrimages, that means that even at the university here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, we started taking our students to uh, Medjugorje with public pilgrimages because we follow church teaching. And in that sense, that is what the church allows. And Father Daniel Maria is a professor there at Steubenville. And we are coming to the end of this wonderful program. My goodness, I'm so grateful to you for explaining so much to us. And um, before you give us a final blessing, if you would, Father, for the listeners, and I'd like to read just a very short message. It was a July 2nd, 2016 message from Our Lady of Medjugorje because I believe it expresses her heart and how she would like us to receive her being with us on earth for so long, not to be afraid of it, not to think that suddenly we're all going to be swept under Satan's rug, but this is a gift, a gift from God. And she says, Dear children, my real living presence among you should make you happy because mm. this is the great love of my son. He is sending me among you so that with a motherly love, I may grant you safety. 
And isn't that what our souls are really seeking in this tumultuous time? Our Lady of Medjugorje and her messages are there to grant us safety. May we feel safe in them and worry no more. Amen. Amen. Well said, Christine. Yeah, I mean, that emphasis that she's our mother and what a privilege it is that she is appearing among us to show gratitude for that, to show love for that, because that's an act of God. That's God loving his children. I am sending my mother. What an incredible honor to be a part of that event in history. Yes. Yeah. And would you grant us a final blessing, please, Father? Absolutely. My my pleasure. Eternal Father, I just ask that you bless every every person who is listening or watching. I ask that you bless bless our families, Lord. Bless uh, bless our faith. Increase our faith. I ask you that you bring us to a deeper love of Jesus through Mary. I ask you that you bring us to a deeper appreciation of her sacred apparitions and that you allow us to surrender our lives to where you are calling us to lord may we grow in conversion and may, may we grow in love may we say yes to the challenges and the missions that you are calling us to and may almighty god bless you dear viewers in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy Spirit. amen amen and may you find your way home this is christine watkins And Father Daniel Maria, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. God bless you.